Good morning, everyone. Hi, so um, the semester has started officially today. I'm glad to see you here. Um, just a couple of announcements. Also, hi to the Extension School students. Uh, last time we said hi to New Zealand. Today we're saying uh, hi to Ireland. <laughs> Um, in terms of sectioning for the, uh, for the uh, undergrads and graduate students here, uh, you will get an email from Sean Acor tomorrow, and you will put in your uh, section preference. We are, we are sectioning this weekend, so it will be important that you submit your top preferences, and next week we're, um, we're starting. So. Last time, if you remember, the question that we asked, the guiding question, was why positive psychology? And I mentioned three reasons why we need it as an independent field, as opposed to just being, well, let's do some studies on happiness, let's do some studies on relationships, as it has always been done. The reason why we need a positive psychology is to shift the pendulum from the 21 to 1 ratio that we have today for every one study on depression or anxiety, we have 21 studies on, sorry, for one study on happiness or well-being, we have 21 studies on depression and anxiety. And we want to shift that pendulum slightly. And I mentioned three reasons why we want to shift this pendulum, despite the fact that there are rising levels of depression around the world, that anxiety has become an epidemic globally. On college campuses in the United States, China, Australia, UK. Despite that fact, I argued that we need to shift that pendulum and do more quote-unquote positive research, or in other words, research that focuses on what works. And the reason is, the first reason that we gave, and we're just finishing up, is because the questions that we ask, whether it's the research questions that we ask, or the questions that we ask of ourselves or of our partners, matter. And if our only questions, or primarily our questions, are what is not working, what is the problem, why are so many kids failing, dis why are so many kids failing as a result of their circumstances, if we only ask these questions, we will miss, literally miss, an important part of reality. Just like you miss the children on the bus in the exercise. Most of you did. And if we also ask the positive question, then suddenly new possibilities, new quests open up. Just like they did for the researchers when they started to ask, no longer why do so many individuals fail, but started to ask, what do some individuals do and succeed? Why do some individuals succeed despite the unfavorable circumstances? And then we had the story of Marva Collins who exemplifies so many of the themes that we'll talk about throughout the course. What Marva Collins did was help her students shift from the passive victim, you're a victim of your circumstances, of your upbringing, neighborhood, country, whatever it is, from a passive victim to an active agent. Yes, it's difficult, it's tough, it's unfair, However, it's your responsibility. No one is coming. It's up to you to make that difference in your lives. And she made a difference to thousands of people's lives and continues to do so. In other words, if we look at the case of the Chicago school system where Marva Collins was teaching, the conventional, traditional question was, if you remember, how can we keep these students in school for as long as possible? How can we keep them in school beyond the age of 10 or 12, so that they don't join street gangs, so that they don't, so that they're not hurt by drugs or crime. How can we keep them safe in school? An important question to ask. However, not enough. Marva Collins comes along and reframes the question. And her question becomes, how can we cultivate the seed of greatness in our students. And that, once again, made all the difference. Because she saw 
the seed of greatness in each student. She saw the strength, the virtues in each single student. A seed, a strength, a virtue, a competence that other teachers did not see because they did not ask this question. Because they asked, metaphorically speaking, how many geometrical shapes do you see on the screen? And they completely miss the children on the bus. They completely miss the seed of greatness. And when we don't see the seed of greatness, when we don't water it and shed light on it, it withers and dies, which is unfortunately the fate of most human potential. Wherever we go, that is the fate of most human potential, interpersonally in relationships, in most organizations, in most universities, in most individuals. Questions make a difference, which is why it is also important to ask the positive psychology question, which is the salutogenic question. What is the source of health? What is the source of success? What is the source of well-being? So that's the first reason. The second reason, before I go to the second reason, if Marva Collins was here today, here is the question that she would be asking us. How can we cultivate the seed of greatness in ourselves and families, in our communities and organizations, in our nation and in our world? And when we ask these que this question, this very important question, suddenly we see possibilities that we didn't see before. Second reason for having positive psychology as a field of study and focusing on what works and focusing on researching happiness and relationships and well-being is because happiness does not spontaneously arise when we take unhappiness away. Now, happiness and unhappiness or happiness and neurosis and psychosis and depression are interconnected, of course. It's very difficult to be happy if we're experiencing severe depression or anxiety. So they're certainly interconnected. However, just getting rid of the anxiety or the depression will not in and of itself make us happy, which is the conventional wisdom today, which is the conventional wisdom of, of many psychologists, practicing psychologists. Well, let's just get rid of that depression and then everything will be fine. It won't. The analogy to explain this is think about the ability to enjoy food, a gourmet meal. Now, if we have indigestion, it is very difficult to enjoy food. So yes, we first need to get rid of the indigestion. However, that in and of itself does not guarantee us that we enjoy food. We have to go out and eat the gourmet food to enjoy it. Just getting rid of indigestion is not sufficient. We need the next step. Many ways you can look at most of our experiences, psychological affective experiences on a continuum where some of them fall below the zero, the negative experiences or the painful experiences and the positive or the pleasurable experiences between the zero and the positive. Neurosis, anger, anxiety, depression, psychosis, to name a few. On the negative side, the painful side, well-being, satisfaction, joy, excitement, happiness on the other side, which is the side that positive psychology studies. Again, getting rid of the negative does not guarantee us the positive, which is why already in the 1840s, already in the 1840s, David Henry Thoreau wrote that most men lead lives of quiet desperation, where it's okay, you know, there's nothing really wrong, but it's just somewhere there, in, you know, in the words of Pink Floyd, people are comfortably numb. Comfortably numb. Not enough. How can we get beyond that comfortably numb? How can we get beyond that quiet, quiet, okay, desperation, to excitement, to joy, to happiness? And in order to do that, we need to cultivate these traits. Once again, they don't spontaneously emerge once the painful experiences go away. And that is why we need a positive psychology. Positive psychology essentially focuses on the health model, salutogenesis. What is the source of health? Physical, psychological, emotional. How do we get people to flourish intellectually, emotionally, psychologically, interpersonally, intrapersonally? How do we get them to thrive? 
beyond just getting rid of what's not working in their lives. And under that model, we see two extremes on many levels. Here, the first level, do we focus on weaknesses, which is what the disease model say, let's get rid of weaknesses, or do we focus on strength? Well, when you ask people this question, and this was done by the Gallup organization, a poll, global poll, whether it's in Japan, China, United States, or Europe, most people think that it's more important to focus on their weaknesses if they are to succeed. Big mistake. The people who focus primarily, not only, remember the also, who shift the pendulum, who focus more on their strength, are not only happier, they're also in the long run more successful. It applies to leadership as well. Positive psychology says let's focus also on our strengths, at least as much. In an organization, as well as on the individual level, are we focused mostly on overcoming deficiencies or building the competencies, what we're good at and getting better at it? What our natural inclination, individually or organizationally, do we focus on that and then build on that? Again, tied to success as well as well-being, if we're more toward the, negative, uh, the positive side. How do we live our lives? Running away from painful experiences or actively seeking pleasure? Running away from unhappiness or adhering to the declaration and pursuing happiness. Now, that may look quite similar. For example, someone may be working 80 hours a week, running away from something, running away from issues at home, running away from dealing with intrapersonal issues. And that may look exactly the same as a person who works 80 hours a week and who is extremely passionate about what she does may look the same, but from the inside, they feel very different. One is the disease model. Let's run away from what's not working. The other is the health model. Let's pursue my passions, what I love to do. With the disease model, the optimum level is the zero. Let's just be okay. Let's just not hurt. And again, that's important to get rid of hurt. It's important to get rid of depression. But what the health model is saying, that's not enough. Let's go beyond that. Let's go to the excitement, to the fun. Because the ideal is not just a tensionless state. It is the creative tension. And we'll talk about it and we'll read about it when we do flow. Flow is the state where we're excited, where we're engaged in what we're doing. Where it's much more than being comfortably numb. In fact, it's being a little bit uncomfortable. It's being outside of our comfort zone. It's being in our stretch zone. Not the panic zone where it hurts, the stretch zone where there is excitement, where there is some nervousness, there is also growth there. So what do you want? Where do you want to go? What do you want to pursue? Do you want to run away from pleasure? A run away from pain? Do you want to run away from unhappiness? Or do you want to pursue happiness and pleasure? Do you want to focus primarily on your deficiencies, your weaknesses, or your strengths? What is the optimum? What is the ideal? Is there a glass ceiling, the zero? Or can it go on and on? More excitement, more enjoyment, more passion. Now, there's something threatening about the health model because there is really no limit and there are less prescriptions there, certainly today, than in the disease model. Positive psychology, the field of health psychology, is in its infancy. There's much more research, much more advice out there on how to get rid of depression than on how do I pursue my strength. But fortunately... And again, this is why positive psychology as a network of scholars applying themselves to, this, to these ideas and ideals is so important. Because today, as you'll see throughout the semester, there are so many more tools that we can apply to our lives to go beyond the zero. That's not all. So we said that there are three reasons. It's about where we focus. Focus creates reality. It's about happiness 
is not just the negation of unhappiness. The third reason why positive psychology is important is because positive psychology and the areas that we study and more importantly apply within the field of positive psychology do not just take us from the zero to the positive. They also help us deal with the negative. They help us deal with anxiety and depression and painful experiences and emotions. When we cultivate the positive, we're essentially focusing on prevention. Let me explain. What has been found over the last 10 years and a little bit longer is that the most effective way of actually dealing with the rising levels of depression in our culture, with individual depression or anxiety, is actually not to focus on the depression and anxiety directly. But that, that is important as well. It was found that the most effective way of dealing with this phenomenon was actually to cultivate the positive, to cultivate personal strength, to cultivate and identify one's passions, to ask a question such as, what is meaningful to me in my life? What's my purpose? Why am I here? What do I really, really want to do once I graduate? People who ask these questions and spend time on these questions are much more likely to begin a quest that is not devoid of the painful emotions. No quest is. But a quest that is more enjoyable, more pleasurable, more meaningful, and also more successful, as it turns out. But more importantly, more successful in what I call the ultimate currency, which I think is the currency of happiness and well-being. The reason is because there are two different approaches to dealing with, with illness. One, the positive psychological approach, is that the illness is the absence of health. As opposed to health is the absence of illness. I mean, think about the disease model. The disease model is we're sick because... We're ill, and we'll... Did you listen to that? We're sick because we're ill. That was very profound. You should think about it for a, for a while here. I'll let it time just to marinate a little bit so that you can... Let me start that again. If we take away the illness, then we become healthy. That's the model, the conventional model. Take away the illness, you become healthy, it's good. The positive psychological model is slightly different. It is you're ill because, because you don't have enough health in your life. Because you're not pursuing those things that make you healthy. And what makes you healthy? The things that I spoke about before. Pursuing meaning, purpose, cultivating healthy relationships. And when we don't have these things, that's when illness comes in. Now, the difference between the two models, the, the model of um, the health model and the disease model, is more than just semantic. Here is Abraham Maslow talking about, um, talking about neurosis. Neurosis is a falling short of what one could have been, and even one could say of what one should have been. Biologically speaking, that is, if one had grown and developed in an unimpeded way. Human and personal possibilities have been lost. The world has been narrowed, and so has consciousness. Capacities have been inhibited. Let me explain what he means here. What he means is that we're ill because we do not cultivate what we're about enough. We do not become self-actualized. We don't do what we're supposed to do. We diminish ourselves, and that's when we become ill. That's when we're unwell. This is very different from the disease model that says, okay, you're unwell, deal with that illness. What he's saying, no, you're unwell, focus on your health, strengthen your health, because you're ill because you haven't focused enough of your, on your health. He calls that, and I quote, a failure of personal growth. That's when we experience neurosis. 
when we don't cultivate ourselves enough, when we don't cultivate our relationships enough, that's when we fail. And what positive psychology is all about is precisely that. Cultivating personal growth. Working on the positive. And when we work on the positive, on what comes on this side of the graph that you saw up there, on the positive side, when we cultivate these things, it also helps us deal much better with the negative when that arises. I want to quote um, Marty Seligman, who, um, who talks about precisely this idea. In the last decade, psychologists have become concerned with prevention. How can we prevent problems like depression or substance abuse or schizophrenia in young people who are genetically vulnerable or who live in worlds that nurture these problems? How can we prevent murderous schoolyard violence in children who have access to weapons, poor parental supervision, and a mean streak? Now he's asking this question, and the disease model response to this is, we need to help them deal directly with their depression and with their anxiety and with their unhappiness so that we can prevent all these social ills, whether it's violence, whether it's unhappiness. What he's saying here is the following. What we have learned over 50 years is that the disease model does not move us closer to the prevention of these serious problems. Indeed, the major strides in prevention have largely come from a perspective focused on systematically building competency, not correcting weakness. In other words, the health model. Let's work on competencies, let's work on strength, let's work on relationships, let's help them identify something meaningful in their life, their passion. And that's how we will, over time, also help what comes on the negative side. Health model versus the disease model that goes directly to deal with the disease. Now again, Seligman is not saying to the exclusion of, he's saying also. He continues. We have discovered that there are human strengths that act as buffers against mental illness, courage, future-mindedness, optimism, interpersonal skill, faith, work ethic, hope, honesty, perseverance, the capacity for flow and insight, to name several. We've shown that learning optimism prevents depression and anxiety in children and adults roughly halving their incidence over the next two years. Similarly, I believe that if we wish to prevent drug abuse in teenagers who grow up in a neighborhood that puts them at risk, that the effective prevention is not remedial. Rather, it consists of identifying and amplifying the strength that these teens already have. It's exactly what Marva Collins did. Focus on the health and cultivated that. Watered it and shed light on it and realized it. We'll talk about all these ideas uh, throughout the course. What the health model does, and this is a theme that will go throughout the course, is cultivate capacity. It cultivates the capacity to deal with the negatives when these arise, whether it's negatives and painful experiences in relationships or in ourselves. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, let me draw on two analogies. Cultivating capacities is about creating a strong psychological immune system. These are the words of Nathaniel Brandon. Psychological immune system. What happens when we have a strong physical immune system? Does it mean that we don't get ill? Of course not. We do. But it means that we get ill less often, and when we do get sick, we recover more promptly. This is exactly what cultivating strength, optimism, sense of purpose, meaning, mindfulness, this is exactly what these characteristics do. They enlarge transform the way we see, the way we experience the world, enlarge the capacity of the form, and thus we're better able to deal with inevitable difficulties. And there are inevitable difficulties. No life is completely immune to those. So strengthens our immune system. Another analogy that we can use is of an engine. If we have a small engine and we have to pull a car up a steep hill, a difficult hill, the engine is more likely to collapse, to blow up. Whereas if our engine is large, 
we're much more likely to get up that hill and to do it more gracefully with, much, with relative, relative ease. So what we're doing when we cultivate the positive, we're strengthening our, metaphorically speaking, psychological engine, and we're better able to deal with the negative to zero. Not to mention the fact that we're also able to become happier. Because happiness does not just come spontaneously when we negate unhappiness. I want to go back to our local village. So remember last time I put up the article by the Crimson. That was, unfortunately, couldn't find a more recent one. That was in 2004. But the situation is rather similar today. And one of the things that the Crimson article says is that we need to put more resources into mental health at Harvard. And that's important, I agree. However, that's only part of the picture. What we also need to do is put the resources in some different places as well, not only, as well. Because it's not just enough to put it in res the resources in places that help us deal with our depression and anxiety and unhappiness directly. It is also important to put these resources in places that help us cultivate capacity. The capacity to deal with these difficulties and hardships when they will arise and they will arise. In other words, there has to be more resources put in places such as helping students identify their passions when they come here. Helping students identify their sense of meaning in life. Helping students identify what they really really, really want to do. Helping students overcome the pull, the external pull that is often there, taking them away from their core. Helping them chip away those limitations, those voices. Helping them identify who they really are. Helping them identify their strengths. And then pursuing those while here at Harvard. All these capabilities, all these skills, are skills that are mostly, and I'm not just talking about Harvard, globally, are mo not, not taught in schools. And we need to teach them. This is not to say that what is going on at Harvard with the numerous resources that we do have here is not important. It is very important. Just a small example, the Bureau of Study Council. I don't know how many of you have used that resource. I've used it as an undergrad. I still use it. Now I'm doing some work with them, did some work with them last year, and they're wonderful. And at the same time, we also need to cultivate the positive, to think more of the zero to the positive side of the equation as well. And this is what positive psychology does, and I hope this is what 15, 1504, to some extent, will help do. To summarize, the message of the positive psychology movement is to remind our field that it has been deformed. Psychology is not just the study of disease, weakness, and damage. It also is the study of strength and virtue. Treatment is not just fixing what is wrong. It is also building what is right. Psychology is not just about illness or health. It is about work, education, insight, love, growth, and play. And in this quest for what is best, Positive psychology does not rely on wishful thinking, self-deception, or hand-waving. Instead, it tries to adapt what is best in the scientific method to the unique problems that human behavior presents in all its complexity. It's about bridging the ivory tower and main street in the area which I believe is the most important one and talks to each and every one of us. I want to move on now. I want to move on to the next set of lectures, two or two and a half lectures, where I'm going to be talking about the basic premises 
of this course. As I said earlier, this course is not a survey course of positive psychology. It's very selective. It's about the question of questions. What can help us as individuals? What can help our community become happier? Not happy, happier. So that by the end of the three-month semester, you're happier than you were before. A year from now, you will be hopefully happier than you were at the end of the semester, and so on and so on. So what are the basic premises? Where, where am I coming from when, when I think about these courses? And what I want to do is share with you the five basic premises. And these premises are going to be presented as something, and essentially it's opposite so that we're clear from the outset where we're coming from, where I'm co coming from, where the teaching staff is coming from, and also so that we can build the foundation of the course. Remember I talked, those of you who were here the first time, this course is built like a spiral. Everything is interconnected. What I talked about the first class is connected to what I'm going to talk about today, is going to be connected to lecture 19. So in many ways the premises, coupled with what we discussed in the first two lectures, build the foundation of that spiral upon which everything else will be built. So here are the five basic premises. I'll go through them briefly now and then elaborate on each in the next couple of lectures, interweaving them with studies, research, as well as applications. First, this course, as I mentioned first, is about bridge building. Bridge building among disciplines, it's eclectic, and bridge building in terms of academia, and Main Street, rather than the division and the separation, the specialization that very often is dominant in academia. This is not, this is, this approach of this course with all its challenges is, is the opposite. Once again, I wouldn't be teaching the class if I didn't think change is possible, that there is a lot of research in psychology, a lot of evidence that shows how difficult change is. So I will argue that change is possible, whether it's individual change organizational change, and we'll start to look at how it's possible. Just at the very basic level of the spiral, we have an entire week just devoted to, to change, where we'll elaborate on that. Techniques, methods, tools. Third premise related to the first, internal factors primarily determine happiness. This is what I'm going to argue for, as opposed to happiness is primarily a function of external circumstances. I'm not saying that external circumstances are not important, that we shouldn't focus also on improving them, bettering them, whether for ourselves, for society at large. However, happiness primarily, not only primarily, is dependent on how we perceive the, the world, on the form, on our interpretation, on our perception. Human nature must be obeyed versus human nature must be perfected. This, in many ways, captures a conflict that has gone through throughout human history, whether you look at politics, whether you look at religion, whether you look at philosophy, as well as today psychology. How do we look at human nature? Is human nature flawed and therefore needs to be perfected? Or is human nature flawed? Maybe there is something that we don't like about it, but we need to accept it and work with it. I'm going to argue for the fir for the for the letter of what I just said, for the fact that human nature needs to be of obeyed with all its flaws, with all its shortcomings, as opposed to attempting to perfect it on a psychological level. We'll get to that next time. Controversial, the very important um, foundation of mental health and well-being. And finally, what I'm going to argue for is that happiness is and ought to be the ultimate end, the end to which we pursue, the end which we pursue, and that is also a moral claim, as opposed to happiness just being another secondary pursuit, and that there are pursuits that are higher, more important, more moral than that. Once again, may sound controversial, I'll try and reconcile the dis-ease, the, the, um, the unhappiness that you may experience thinking about that. Again, more on that next time. So let me begin with bridge building. Here I'm going back to what I talked about right at the very beginning of the first lecture, the idea of bridging Ivory Tower and Main Street. There are many people 
in academia, outside of academia, who divide the world essentially into two. They talk about the real world that is outside, that is dirty, impure, profane, versus academia, which is lofty, idealistic, sacred. The sacred versus the profane. This distinction hurts. Hurts academia and hurts people who are outside of academia. Alfred North Whitehead, the philosopher, the careful shielding of a university from the activities of the world around us is the best way to chill interest and to defeat progress. Celibacy does not suit a university. It must mate itself with action. This is very important for, <clears throat> for a university. Sheldon White, who was my thesis advisor as an undergraduate here, talked about a second psychology. And he said a second psychology is a psychology that leaves the labs, that draws on research done in the labs, that is important and meaningful, however, doesn't only focus on that. It goes out to the outside world, interacts, gets its, its hands, its minds dirty, does work outside, and then applies its work, and then learns from the quote-unquote dirty experiences and brings it back to the lab and so on and so on in an upward spiral. He called it a, the importance of a second psychology, which is what Alfred North Whitehead is also talking about. Now you may be sitting here and most of you are not going to go into academia. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, fine, so university, uh, academia must make itself with action. What, what does it have to do with me? How is this relevant to me? Not only is it relevant to you, it has everything to do with you. And here is why. What the world needs more than anything else is practical idealists. For six years, I was a resident tutor in Leverett House, when I was a graduate student and then also when I started to teach. And what struck me most about conversations that I had either in Leverett, in other houses, with students is their sense of mission, your sense of mission, your desire to do good, to make the world a better place. And as I followed many of the students after they graduated, whether students who were with me here as undergrad, undergrads or students whom I tutored, when I followed the paths, it wasn't just empty words. These students went ahead and did wonderful things, whether it was right out of college, whether it was once they established themselves. But there was always this in the back of their mind, very often the fore of their minds. How can I make this world a better place? passionate, idealistic, good, in the deepest sense, good. This desire to make a difference, common to just about all students. There are many people who talk about this generation as the me generation. All I care about, all this generation cares about is, well, let me just make more money. Let me just get a bigger house. Let me just be more successful and accrue more accolades, more prestige. This is a false stereotype. Yes, accolades, prestige, money is important. It's important to most people in the world. Big deal. But what these people who have these stereotypes, where they are, is that they see just that. And they don't see the desire to make a difference. You know that 1,800 students at Harvard each year, above 1,800 students, are members of PBHA. That's not all. There are other students who are outside PBHA and who volunteer. Just about every single one of you, at least if we look at statistics, just about every single one of you, very soon after you leave Harvard, will join an organization, whether 
it could be your primary job or not, an organization that is a social enterprise, a not-for-profit, something to better the world. You'll be on boards of such organizations. You'll donate money to such organizations. Harvard grads are generous with their time, with their money, with their efforts. Whether they're at the business school, the law school, college, med school, ed school, you give a lot because you care. Again, whether it's money, whether it's time, usually both. False stereotypes. There's also false stereotypes about Americans. Americans, empirically speaking, just like speaking empirically about Harvard students and looking at the trends and the statistics, empirically speaking, Americans are the most generous people in the world. Not just because they have more money to give. Yes, they have, Americans have more money to give and they give a lot more money whether it's in food, whether it's in medical aid. Americans also spend the most time, and this is research done at Dartmouth, Americans spend the most time out of any other people in the world volunteering, an average of four hours a week, volunteering outside of their job, which may also have a social, a social objective, more than any other people in the world. Once again, false stereotypes about this wonderful country. And this is wonderful. This is wonderful to see, wonderful to be, to be here, whether it's at Harvard, whether it's in America, a real privilege. You see, many of you, not far from now, not a not long time, you will be in influential positions where you will be able to do a lot of good in a for-profit organization, not-for-profit organization on the board of your previous school, with your money, with your time, however. And here is the however. I've met many grads who were students with me, or students when I was a tutor, who expressed their frustration to me. Said to me, you know, I had all the good intentions in the world. I have all the good intentions in the world. I want to do good. I've donated my time, my money. But I feel that something is missing. I feel that I've fallen short of my potential to really make a difference. Why? Because goodwill and idealism, while necessary, they're not sufficient. Not enough. Because very often, with very good intentions, we may fall short of what we're capable of doing, or, in some situations, even hurt more than help. And we'll look at some of these studies, hopefully still today, where very good intentions actually hurt more than they helped. Psychologists for decades had very good intentions about helping at-risk population. A lot of money, millions and millions of dollars went into that. With very little effect. Why? Because they didn't also ask a question that they needed to ask, which was, in that particular case, the salutogenic question, why do some individuals succeed despite unfavorable circumstances? There were very good intentions before this question was asked. There was a lot of idealism. It wasn't enough. And very often, some of these interventions engendered the passive victim mentality as opposed to the active agent mentality that Marva Collins instilled, that programs by Karen Rivich and Marty Seligman in Still. And this is where psychology can help. You see, because we can take the research and apply it. We can take this research and apply it, which goes back to the point why it's so important to bridge Ivory Tower and Main Street. Most of this research is not applied. So for example, how many teachers working in the classroom day in and day out know about the Pygmalion effect? The Pygmalion effect that we're going to talk about next week or the week after shows how teachers' expectations 
are self-fulfilling prophecies. And if we have high expectations, if we see the seed of greatness in the student, that seed of greatness is much more likely to flourish. Whereas if we don't appreciate it, it will depreciate, wither and die. Not many teachers know about this, these studies and how they create, through their beliefs, a self-fulfilling prophecy when it comes to their students. How many teachers know about Marvel Collins? Every teacher in the world, on the first day of teacher training, needs to learn about Marvel Collins and the Pygmalion effect. They don't do that. How about this? Self-esteem. How do you increase self-esteem? If I had to do a poll here, most people, guaranteed, would say, praise people. Praise people, praise children, it will enhance your self-esteem. Right, partially right, and if it's taken as the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, it's detrimental. Because there's a lot of research that shows that when we praise people indiscriminately, we're actually, in the long run, potentially hurting them more than we're helping them. Whether it's their well-being, as well as their success. But the self-esteem movement mostly says, praise people, praise children all the time. And again, that's important. But it's also important to know how to praise. How many people are familiar with the work of the Stanford psychologist, Carol Dweck? Well, you're going to be familiar with it in a few weeks. Idealists, many idealists with good intentions are not. And they continue to support or to practice self-esteem as indiscriminate praise, ultimately hurting more than helping. How many psychologists, or how, rather, how many interventionists with good intentions are familiar with the work of Albert Bandura on self-efficacy and how you cultivate that? Not enough. And very often, more harm than good is created. How many psychologists are familiar with this new emerging field of the mind and body? How many know about the studies that show, for example, that yoga practice diminishes significantly, significantly, more than any other intervention that they tried, the likelihood of second-time offenders when they practice it in jail. After they are released, they are much less likely to return to jail if they did some yoga there. Strange, but true. How many people know that and this is connected to my first point, that doing meditation actually literally transforms our brain, making us more susceptible to positive emotions and more resilient in the face of painful emotions. How many people know that three times a week, physical exercise, 30 minutes each time, has the same effect as our most powerful psychiatric drugs. Three times a week for 30 minutes. How many psychologists or psychiatrists prescribe run three times a week and come see me in the morning? Not enough. That's practical idealism coupled together. How about in conflict resolution? The dominant theme of most people with good intentions who want to resolve conflict is let's get the people together, let's get them to talk, and they and we will live happily ever after. Well, we have research from 1954, those of you who have taken social psych, Muzaffar Sharif, showing that the contact hypothesis, which is just get people to talk to, get to one another, doesn't work. In fact, very often it worsens the situation. Very often the conflict actually gets worse as a result of just getting together and talking. That contact is not enough. That what you need, in the words of Muzaffar Sharif, and later elaborated on by Elliot Aronson, what you need is a superordinate goal. A goal that you have to carry out together that you cannot do by yourself. Carry out together with a conflicting group. And that's how, over time, you resolve conflicts, not just bringing people together. Now, as you can imagine, this is very close to home for me. 
because there were many people on both sides of the Arab-Israeli conflict who wanted to end it. Many people in this country who wanted to end it. So what did they do? Let's just get them together. Let's get them in a room, whether it was in Camp David or whether it was in Oslo or in Egypt. Let's just get them together to talk, to resolve their conflict and the issue, and then we will all live happily ever after. What happened? The situation worsened. Now, we have the data. We, we, we have known that. You know, Muzaffar Sharif showed that in 1954 that that is the most likelihood outcome of just contact hypothesis, of just getting them to be together. And there were many people trying to resolve the conflict, okay, not just in the Middle East, elsewhere in the world, with very good intentions, but very often making inadvertently the matter is worse. Idealism and good intentions are not enough. We need to merge, to mate, the research with the practice. And this is where you come in. This is where you come in, taking it seriously. Now, when I say take it seriously, there is a problem here because sometimes research doesn't deliver good news. It would be much easier and nicer if we could just simply get Israelis and Arabs together, and the conflict would end. It would be much nicer, easier, smoother. It would be much easier if we could just cultivate children's self-esteem by giving them positive feedback, telling them how wonderful they are. It's easy to do, right? It feels good, they feel good, we feel good. But in the long run, it doesn't help if it's only that. Much easier. And research very often delivers bad news, saying it's not enough the contact. It's not enough to praise. And then people choose subconsciously, not consciously, subconsciously to ignore the research and go with their heart. And that's important to go with the heart, but it's important to go with the heart and the mind. Imagine if a aeronautics engineer woke up in the morning and said, um, you know, the law of gravity thing really makes things difficult for me. It's a pain. You know, things would be so much easier without the law of gravity. The design would be simpler. And he designs an airplane that ignores the law of gravity. What kind of airplane machine would he or she design? A failure. An aeronautics engineer takes into consideration reality. And reality, there is the law of gravity. We deal with that. Similarly, what research shows us is reality, what's out there, what's working and what's not working. And we need to conform to it, take it into consideration. And it's up to you to take responsibility for that, to bridge the ivory tower in Main Street. You who are being exposed in 32 classes throughout your Harvard career to the most rigorous thinking on different topics have to take it and apply it whether it's in psychology whether it's in economics obviously in engineering or computer science where it's done much more readily than in the social sciences and the humanities it's important to take responsibility because no one else is going to do it for you no one is coming Premise two. To be a practical idealist, the foundation of it has to be the belief that change is possible. Because if change was not possible on the individual level, on the societal level, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why would I spend time? Let me just be a hedonist and try and enjoy my life as much as possible. Now, for many of you, when you look at this, you may say, well, okay, yeah, change is possible. I believe that. And why do we need to have it as a basic premise of the course as opposed to the change is elusive? Well, in the context of a psychology course, it's anything but trivial The change is possible. Let me share with you one study to illustrate what I mean. The 
Minnesota twin study, one of the most famous studies in the field of psychology, <coughs> was done by uh, Lykin and Telegan, two prominent psychologists. And what they did was they wanted to understand how much do genes matter? How much is it about nature versus nurture? So how do you test that? You look at identical twins, monozygotic twins who share the same genetic profile. And you look at those who are reared apart. Because if they're reared with the same parents, one could argue, well, they came out very similar because same environment, they look the same, they go to the same schools, same parents, and so on. But what if you're able to find identical twins who were separated at birth and reared in radically different environments? Well, you could. And they found a significant number of those reared sometimes on different continents. And they studied them. And what they found, remarkably, was significant similarities among these twins, sometimes to the point of the unbelievable. Like one, one set of twins, I think the name were, found um, a wife with the same name. They were reared different countries. Didn't know about each other until the age of 37. Married similar wives, enjoyed the drinking the same beer, um, called their children by the same names. I mean, there were some mind-boggling similarities. And this was an exception, but there were quite a few of those exceptions. But more interesting for psychologists was that their personality was incredibly similar. And very interesting for positive psychologists, those concerned with well-being and happiness, their well-being and happiness levels were incredibly similar even if they were raised in radically different environments. Lycan and Telegan published a, pi a paper, a very influential paper in the 80s, which they called happiness as a stochastic phenomenon. Happiness as a stochastic phenomenon. And they end this paper with the following quote. It may be that trying to be happier is as futile as trying to be taller and is therefore counterproductive. This quote made me very unhappy on two accounts. This was a very influential quote. I mean, this appeared in the New York Times. They talked about it on television. They were interviewed. Very problematic, because what are we doing here? If this is the outcome of research and rigorous research that they did, I mean, not easy research to go and look around the world, what can we do about it? Well, here is my response to that. Very simply, change is possible. And again, don't take my word for it, of course. Let me discuss that further, elaborate. There is counter evidence where people actually do change. And we have research showing that people go into therapy, very often change as a result of therapy. Work by Albert Bandura, Stanford psychologist, shows that very often people encountering one special sentence, reading it or hearing it from something, that sentence can change their lives. Reading a certain book, having certain experiences, positive or painful experiences. There is this concept of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. There is also the concept of post-traumatic growth. So people change up or down in their levels of happiness as a result of experiences. So there, are, there is counter evidence that shows that not everyone's level of well-being is determined by their, by their genes. In fact, there is research that shows that, yes, genes do matter, and they matter a lot. But as we'll talk about during the week on change, other things matter as well. And the error that Lycan and Telegan and many others make 
when they generalize and say change is not possible is what I call the error of the average. Yes, on average, when you looked at this group of 40 or 50 twins reared apart, when you look at the average, they're just about the same. However, that's not looking at individuals because while many of them are the same, not all are the same. You know, it reminds me of, um, of a joke about the statistician who drowned in a pool with an average height of 10 inches. Drowned in a pool with an average height of 10 inches. You see, you cannot tell the height or the depth, rather, of a pool based on the average. Because that pool may be average of 10 inches, but it may have places that are 20 feet deep, if it's a large pool. The same when you look at the average of individuals and twins. The majority, or on average, they're extremely similar, but they're also outliers. And very often it's the outliers, the differences, that are the most interesting, because they stretch not just our imagination, they stretch our ability to understand when and where change is possible. The question when we see exceptions, whether it's the Lycan Intelligence Study, where we do see exceptions, not all twins were the same. Majority were, but not all. The question is no longer whether or not change is possible, but rather how is change possible. Once again, the exception proves the rule. And the research that argues that it's not possible to change is detrimental. Think about an eight-year-old girl <clears throat> who's very unhappy and then reads in some magazine about that study saying that basically your genetic set point, what you're born with, is there for life. And she's unhappy and she feels anxious and miserable as an eight-year-old and she says to herself, that's it. That's my lot in life. I was born unlucky. And that very often becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And she remains unhappy. And sometimes it even makes her less happy than she was before. Because now she's also helpless. Change is possible. You know, I often say that I'm the right person to teach positive psychology. Why? Because I wasn't born with quote-unquote happy genes. I was born with, genetically speaking, with relatively high levels of anxiety, inclination toward rumination, over-examination. We'll talk about that later in the course. I started, I went into positive psychology, into the field of psychology, as I mentioned in the first lecture, because I was unhappy here. And over time, as a result of many of these studies, a result of examination, a result of asking also the right questions, I have become happier. So on a personal level, I know it's possible to become happier. Now, I'm happier today than I was 15 years ago when I started. I hope to be happier 15 years today from today than I am today. It's a lifelong process, but it is possible, and many people show that it is possible. And those who argue that it's not possible and use signs to argue for that very often are hurting more than helping the field. Now, by the way, um, Lycan and Telegon were, were interviewed recently in um, Times Magazine issue on happiness. And let me quote to you what, um, what they said. This is in 2005, Lycan. I made a dumb statement. It is clear that we can change happiness levels, up or down. So they went back on their statement, you know, it was a sensationalist statement at the time. It certainly is possible. So how do we do research that's more responsible, that does not lead to detrimental results, and at the same time, true? You know, we don't want to invent research. Research is about identifying things that really occur, happen in reality. So one of the first things that I will argue for in terms of healthy research is let's also focus on what is working. That's the first thing that we discussed in the past lecture. The second thing that I will argue for, in addition to studying what works, is also to study the best. What do I mean by that? So it's not just let's study 
what makes people happy. Let's not just study happy people. Let's not just study what makes happy relationships and good relationships. Let's study the happiest people. Let's study the most successful relationships and learn from that. Now, that is a radically different approach than studying just the average. Because what I'm saying here is let's not study the average. Let's study the top 5% so that we can understand a phenomenon better. The person who talks about this is Abraham Maslow when he talks about growing tip statistics. Let me read to you. This is taken from, um, from his book. What this kind of research design means is a change in our conception of statistics and especially of sampling theory. What I'm frankly espousing here is what I've been calling growing tip statistics. Taking my title from the fact that it is at the growing tip of a plant that the greatest genetic action takes place. What he's saying is that let's study the sages, the saints, the extraordinary people, the arrowhead, so that we can understand rea and realize the potential in all people. Let me quote him in greater length. This is very important, which is why I'm doing it. If we want to know how fast a human being can run, then it is no use to average out the speed of a good sample of the population. It is far better to collect Olympic gold medal winners and see how well they can do. If we want to know the possibilities for spiritual growth, value growth, or moral development in human beings, then I maintain that we can learn most by studying our most moral, ethical, and saintly people. On the whole, I think it is fair to say that human history is a record of the ways in which human nature has been sold short. The highest possibility of human nature have practically always been underrated. Certainly it seems more and more clear that what we call normal in psychology is really a psychopathology of the average. So undramatic and so widely spread that we don't even notice it ordinarily. Do you see the implications of what he's saying here? Essentially what he's saying is, let's not just study why do most individuals fail, let's also study why do some, not many, but why do some individuals succeed despite the circumstances. Let's not study just the average that says that people can't really change. Let's study those people who have changed who have tra literally transformed their lives and the lives of those around them. This is a radical approach to research. This is a radical approach to the search, to studying ourselves as well. Because very often if we only study the average, we only see the average, we only see the geometrical shapes and completely miss the children on the bus. And very often the answer to some of our most pressing questions lies in the extraordinary lies in the children on the bus. Now, does anyone other than me, because I admit I fall into this category, category, but anyone other than me feel a little bit of dis-ease when I talk about this? Seriously, it's a little bit of dis-ease when I talk about let's focus on and study the best, the saints, the sages, the extraordinary. I feel this, this is. I'm sure some of you feel that too. Because after all, isn't that elitist? Shouldn't we study the average because we're concerned not just with the elites, we're concerned with the average? So there are two answers to that. Why? I still maintain, and, and I must admit, I still feel some dis-ease every time I teach this, every time I think about this. And then I think to why it is so important to study the best, why the growing tip statistics is such an important approach to research that I encourage my students to carry out. First of all, because it's not to the exclusion of the average. Just like positive psychology does not say, let's exclude 
what's not working, let's exclude study of pathology. Similarly, growing tip statistic is not saying let's not study the average. It says let's also, let's also study the best. So this is the first thing to alleviate the concern of elitism. But the second issue, the second response is even more important. Because everyone, everyone benefits when we study the best. And the quote unquote average, whatever that means, the quote unquote average benefits even more than the best from this kind of studies. Why? For example, the study of resilience. We could have gone on and studied the average at risk population for decades and centuries. And very little advances would have been made. Very little advances were made. It was only when we started to study those quote unquote best examples, those successful kids, those quote unquote super kids as they were initially named. It's only when we started to study those that we actually understood how we can best help that population. And once we applied what we studied, the resilience issue, everyone benefited and continues to benefit from it. That's an example of growing tip statistic research. Or how about the study of meditation? So I want to study how to meditate. Do I go out to Harvard Yard and take a random sample of sophomores to study meditation? Or do I go to a mountaintop in Tibet and study the people who have been doing it for decades? Of course I go and study them, and this is exactly what psychologists did. And they studied their brain, and we'll talk about it when we talk about meditation, and they illustrated how the brain is transformed through meditation. And psychologists like John Kabat-Zinn and Richard Davidson and Herbert Benson were able to take what they learned from these extraordinary best individuals and apply it to other people's lives so that now I benefit from meditation when I do it for 15 or 20 minutes a day and millions of other people. The average benefits a great deal because of the study of the best, of the growing tip. How about relationships? Can you imagine a study of re relationships throughout human history that focuses on the average? What's the average relationship in human history? The average relationship in human history is one in which the woman is subjugated. That's the average relationship in human history. Now what if we just studied that? Would that be helpful? No, it was when people like John Stuart Mill, who studied his relationship, which was at the time extraordinary, realized the potential of what all relationships can be that he wrote his book on the subjugation of women. One of the most important books of the 19th century that has led to the feminist movement and to the equality movement. But what if we only studied the average? Would that have helped relationships? Not at all. How about teaching? What do you want to do? in order to learn about teaching. Go and study the average teachers or go and study Marva Collins and then apply what Marva Collins does to all teachers. Everyone benefits when we focus on the tip of the stem and this is why um, Maslow said that human nature and human potential has been sold short when we only study the average. It's also about studying our personal best not just other people's best, whether it's our personal best experiences, because if we study our best experiences when we were at our happiest, when we were at our most successful, when we thrived the most within the relationship, we can learn from it and apply it to our future as well. When we study our average, we're describing our lives. When we're studying the best within ourselves, we're potentially prescribing. Maslow again, few in number though they may they be, we can learn a great deal about values from the direct study of these highly evolved, most mature, psychologically healthiest individuals. 
and from the study of the peak moments of average individuals, moments in which they became transiently self-actualized. If we learn from these experiences in ourselves, the question is no longer whether or not it's possible to experience it more and more in our lives. The question is, how is it possible to experience it? All right. So we talked about changing ourselves, how it's possible, the growing tip statistic, which is the second significant idea within research in positive psychology. The first significant idea is let's study what works. The second significant idea is let's study what works best. But this is about individual change. How about societal change? I want to share with you an end today with a study. One of the most famous studies in the field called the Cambridge Somerville Youth Study. This was a study that was run starting in the 1930s, right here, between Harvard, MIT, where the best minds, psychological minds, philosophical minds, psychiatrists, got together and said, let's create the Rolls-Royce, I don't even know if there was a Rolls-Royce then, but the best intervention program that we can think of. There was no limit in terms of how much money was put into it. As much as they needed, they got, and they chose 250 kids from an at-risk population. And the intervention was not a quick fix, overnight change, weekend seminar, five-year intervention. And here is what they got. Twice a month, caseworkers visited them, helped them deal with conflicts in the family, helped them deal with issues in their lives. Half of them had academic tutoring, those who needed it, got help, academic help. Psychiatric attention, all those who needed it, they were there. No limits on how, how much you needed. Whatever you needed, you got from the best minds in the field. They joined the Boy Scouts, YMCA, other youth movements, benefited a great deal, supposedly, from these experiences. They got everything. This would be a dream treatment, not just in the 1930s, today as well. This is what psychologists dream over at night, about at night, just to introduce this. And then, measuring outcomes was as serious as the program itself. There was a random assignment. There were 250 kids who got nothing, who were also studied, just like the kids who got the five-year intervention were studied. 250 kids in the control group. 40 years follow-up. So this was not just about change today, tomorrow for the five years. They followed them through much of their lives. This was serious study. This was serious intervention. And the results were shocking. Even though all those who participated in the study, whether it was the mental health workers, whether it was the philosophers and the psychologists and the professors and the psychiatrists, praised the program as the best, as highly effective, when they looked at the raw objective data, the results were shocking. Juvenile offenses, control group versus intervention group, no difference. Over a third had official records and 20 more percent had unofficial records for misdemeanors. No difference in juvenile offenses. Adult offenses later on in their lives. Again, no difference. Over 20 percent offenses, whether against property or against person, in both groups, the 250 here versus the 250 here, which is a significant sample size. No difference whatsoever. Other measures, physical health and mental health, no difference whatsoever. But finally, there was a significant difference on alcoholism, the number of people who became uh, alcoholic later on in life, as well as job status. How many people were able to get into what, what they de termed the white collar jobs? So at least there are results there. At least they found significantly, statistically significant results when it came to that. That's good, right? Not at all. Because these results were quote unquote in the wrong direction, meaning there were more alcoholists in the intervention group than in the control group. There were more people in the control group 
making it, quote unquote, at work, raising them, their status at work, than in the intervention group. In other words, the intervention did more harm than good. Idealism, good intention, a lot of money, wasn't practical. Now, many people who look at this study, this is a seminal study, there are very few studies in the history of psychology that were that serious. They say, well, societal change is probably not possible. Give me one minute, I'll, and, and I'll finish. Societal change is not possible, they say. Is it? Well, first of all, there are exceptions, and when we have exceptions, that proves the rule. There are programs that actually work, whether it's the work, again, of, of Karen Rivich and Marty Seligman from UPenn Resilience Program, whether it's Marva Collins, who's certainly an exception, who shows how interventions work. And it's interesting to think about the difference between what Marva Collins does, where she doesn't give the students a sense of entitlement, where she praises them, but she gives them hard love as opposed to a free lunch, where she doesn't label them as needy, and the study perhaps labeled these kids as needy. There are many differences, but the key is to study this exception and for practical idealists to come together and to say, what is working? Let's study the best. Let's study what works and then apply it. Let's spread the word. Let's do what Maslow talked about back in the 1950s. What he suggested is a Manhattan Project type attack upon what I consider to be the truly big problem of our time, not only for psychology but for all human beings with any sense of historical urgency. The Manhattan Project, when they created the atomic bomb, and whether or not you agree with the Manhattan Project normatively, positively what... One second, I'm almost done. Positively what they did there was bring together the best minds, Oppenheimer's, Zillard, Fermi, Feynman, Bohr, bring them together with a mission of saving the free world. And again, whether you agree or not with the project is beside the point. It was the greatest, positively speaking, scientific project in history where the minds got together. And this is what Maslow is suggesting that psychologists do. This is also the aim of positive psychology, no less than this, to get people around the world to think about these problems, these issues. Practical idealists who will study what works, who will study the best, and through that, make a difference. I'll see you next week.